Welcome to Body Kindness. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, creator of the Body Kindness Philosophy book and audiobook. I'm here to help you create a better life by reinventing health from the body oppressive, shaming, and you'll never be enough type of mindset to positive and joyful ways that you can spiral up your energy, mood, and your well being at any size, shape, or weight, and as you are right now. Get started for free at bodykindnessbook.com slash start. That's the sound of me smashing a stack of scales in front of some friends. And I have to say that breaking up with the scale and all the other ways I was judging, monitoring, and measuring my worth was absolutely pivotal in my life. Creating the body kindness philosophy and letting myself be a human being again helped me become a better mom, a better clinician, and a happier and healthier person. I believe we all have a right to decide how we want to care for ourselves, and I think we all need support in figuring out what that looks like. You don't have to do this alone. There's a whole community of like-minded people who are fed up with diets, who are embracing intuitive eating, and who are completely redefining their lives from body shame to body kindness. You are not broken. Our culture is. Find your inner caregiver and create a better life with body kindness. When we hit up against fat phobia, for example, it triggers a biologic stress response where we release cortisol, that's a stress hormone. Our senses, many of our senses become more acute. And so we're ready to kind of jump into action, whether it's to respond quickly to the situation, to run away whatever it is, but there's biology that's at play. So even if in our minds, we know that that was fat phobia, we didn't deserve that. Our bodies are good. That doesn't matter. There's this physiologic response that's going on in reaction to it that we don't have control over. That was Dr. Lindo Bacon. Dr. Bacon is fostering a global transformation to a more just world where all bodies are valued, respected, and supported in compassionate self-care, which doesn't that just sound lovely if we could move toward a world where that was possible? Um, These are topics that we discuss in Dr. Bacon's latest book, Radical Belonging, How to Survive and Thrive in an Unjust World While Transforming It for the Better. I really hope you get something powerful and meaningful out of this conversation. We discuss uh, Dr. Bacon's own experience with gender identity and being misgendered, good intention of of, uh, Dr. Bacon's parents growing up, but experiences of harm. And we get into conversations about what it means to belong, how you can find communities of belonging and how they might benefit you and how we can look and name problems in the systems and structures that keep us separated, that keep us not belonging, and at the same time practice necessary and compassionate self-care while we navigate this unjust world. I'm also personally very excited about a conversation we have toward the end of the interview around diabetes. Being somebody who is a dietitian and exercise expert, not many people know, but I have several family members with diabetes. I do counseling with folks with diabetes, and um, there's so much harm that exists when there's an intersection of of weight and diabetes. And I am really working hard to try to offer a space where folks can uh, heal and practice body kindness and positive self-care when there is a diagnosis of diabetes. And um, the support that I have there is called self-care for diabetes. So there's a link for this in the show notes if you would like to check that out. And please be sure that you check out Dr. Bacon's website, lindobacon.com. 
And there you can find more information about the book, Radical Belonging. I was very honored to be asked to review the book in advance and offer it a praise. And there is a who's who list of folks who have praised the book. And one of the things that I appreciate most about it, and you'll hear this come across in a couple of the readings I chose, was the focus that the issues that you feel when you feel disconnected from your bodies are not a personal failing. It's the culture that's failing you. Dr. Linda Bacon, welcome to Body Kindness. Oh, it's so wonderful to be here with you, Rebecca. <laughs> the pleasure is all mine. I just I just felt this shift in my energy, like big grin. And this is really truly an honor um, to share this time with you. And, you know, I always like to let listeners know how I came to know my guests. And I'm sure many listeners have um, have discovered you. And if they haven't, they're in for a real treat. But this conversation is really, really personally meaningful to me. When I found one of your earlier works, um, the book Health at Every Size, it was like, for the time, the ultimate mic drop. <laughs> I had so many big feelings around what I was reading. I felt very contradicted in what I believed about bodies and health. And in my own experience, um, I was finishing up my dietetic internship and I just kept thinking about everything that I had been learning. And so I also had a good bit of rage, you know, several times I may have thrown the book across the room. <laughs> But without question, this book, you know, at the time in my life where I was really trying to figure out how to live my value of helping people and confronting with the fact that I was very likely, you know, unintentionally um, upholding um, body oppression and weight stigma and doing harm, it really provided me with a strong sense of urgency to put myself in a place where I could learn and grow and change and, you know, try to think differently about what that value of helping people really means. And it led to me be, um, joining ASDA, Association for Size, Diversity, and Health. And it was very pivotal in the early stages. I know we've talked privately, but I just want to say again, for the record, I, I don't think there would be a body kindness philosophy or book if it wasn't for you and all your wonderful work and your health at every size book. And you know, I'm just so excited to be able to, to talk to you and let you know what an impact you made in my life, not just early on, but in the years since then. And I'm really excited to focus with you on ways your life has changed and evolved since then. Uh, that is just so sweet to hear. I, I'm I'm crying here, mm -hmm. and yeah, I think one of the things, one of the reasons I'm crying is because when I think about you and your work and what you're putting out in the world, like you have such an incredible sense of presence and compassion, and you know, it's it's not surprising to me you use the word kindness in your book and to define your work. Because I feel that from you. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, it really like touches me to know that I've influenced that path. And two, just it's so nice to just be here together and mm -hmm. to, you know, both of us have this mission in the world. We want to make this world a better place. And it's good to be here with one another and have opportunity to do it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm personally so focused on the value of community and connection. And, and that community might be like we're talking about this space and that and and that important one other, right? We are in community right now. And and when we end our conversation today, we will be connecting with others and also in community. And you know, I think the very idea that we're somehow completely separate entities and separate, you know, operating in separate spheres is very much um, at the core of a lot of our injustices and harm that we're experiencing now today. So the more we could focus on that connection and collaboration, 
I think there's just so much healing to be done. Definitely. Which brings us to the title of my book. Yes. Um, Radical Belonging, because this is the world that I want. I want a world where we feel that connection with one another. And it's so hard to find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you like to talk a little bit more about why you think it's so hard to find it? I love the book title, by the way, the title, the cover, the content. I have several questions about the content, but it's just, it really is beautiful. It's a beautiful story. It's powerful writing. And I, so many people learn through others' experiences, and it really is, you know, when I was reading through it, it's like I felt I felt like I've known you like I've never come to know you before. Thanks. That's a wide open question, and so <laughs> I, I'm not sure where to put my focus here. But what I do know is that everybody that's listening to this right now has experienced a feeling of unbelonging at some point mm -hmm. where you're sitting in a group of people and all of a sudden you just feel like there's something else that they're just assuming or that they share in common and it's just not you and you're not being seen. And for some of this, this plays out because we may have um, a marginalized identity. And mm -hmm. so we're not as accustomed to seeing ourselves represented in the world. Or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we're used to, maybe we're a person of color and we're used to moving in all white circles mm -hmm. and, you know, feeling that sense of difference or alienation. But everybody's got some way in which they feel like they don't belong. and. For me, one of the hallmarks and the strongest places where I felt like I didn't belong had to do with my gender identity. Everybody saw me as a girl and still to this day relates, many people relate to me as a woman. Mm -hmm. And I just don't feel that. And so as soon as that assumption happens, like I feel like I'm being shut out of the conversation and I'm not being seen. And while I don't think that many people have that same experience of gender identity that I, I do, because I think that most cisgender people, for example, are used to being seen and it, it wouldn't occur to them that like they don't recognize that as a privilege. It's mm -hmm. just assumed, you, you know, that everybody sees you, for example, as a woman and you don't. You don't have to fight for that acknowledgement. It's there all the time. And I think that it makes sense that most people in this culture where we have this idea of a gender binary and mm -hmm. that everybody fits into one category, man or women, woman, and we know how to identify them, it makes sense that people make those assumptions mm -hmm. about me all mm -hmm. the time. And I'm also working to create a world that recognizes that those assumptions we make, they're not natural. They're mm -hmm. not based on what we know to be true culturally or even biologically. Mm -hmm. That we know whether we look at things culturally or biologically, that there, there are more than two ways to express gender and to have a gender. And that Gender doesn't necessarily correlate to biology either, mm -hmm. but yet this hasn't seeped into the general public yet, and we still make these assumptions. Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting. I didn't, really didn't want to go there right away in this interview. That's funny. It's my first question, in. actually. <laughs> I suppose because it's an area of vulnerability, because mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people just don't get this mm -hmm. and that I don't want my identity to be defined in terms of difference, mm -hmm. because it's something that people are going to grab onto mm -hmm. when this is just one aspect of who I am who and not are. even a very important aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd rather people find connection with me mm -hmm. than 
focus in on stuff that's going to be hard for some people. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to reflect back with you. Um, so I mentioned it was my first question and the way it jumped out at me because I, I often, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about my many intersecting privileges. And, and then I think about my role as a parent of two kids and, you know, right now, um, what we're seeing is, you know, cisgender female, you know, we're going with it. And I'm also wanting to teach them that gender is not a binary. So we have talked about that. Gender is not a binary. We have watched videos together. They're six and eight and they, they, A, they really do get it. And B, they respond with really important questions of curiosity I, one of the many areas of your book that I highlighted, speaking about uh, you identifying as gender queer and gender is not a binary, you say you don't have to understand someone's perspective to respect that it's valid, nor do you have to be comfortable with someone's perspective to treat them with respect. I love that because so this is the value I want to teach my children right here. They can understand this. We can read this. This is what I want to teach them. And we'll find it's not one conversation. It's many. And it's very important. And I just, I read what you wrote in the these two sentences and really throughout the book is it's, it's a real offering. It's an offering of love and compassion. So I very much relate to it as an expression of collective well-being and body kindness. That's sweet. And, um, yeah, I'm glad that those words were meaningful for you because I do think they're very important. And I also want to just take those words just a step further mm -hmm. to just acknowledge how challenging that is. Because particularly when we have dominant identities, because what happens is if you're cisgender and you've never you've always been seen for your gender identity, you don't, it may never even occur to you what the experience is like for somebody else. So you may be misgendering people all the time. And because this is how you're taught, you're mm -hmm. not taught to have that kind of openness mm -hmm. about people. Mm -hmm. And this is the challenge of our times right now, mm -hmm. is we're recognizing that People different than us have very different experiences in the world, and we haven't seen their experiences. You know, the fact that so many white people are shocked to see the Black experience and what, what they've been experiencing through encountering police for decades now or, mm -hmm. or forever, and that white people weren't even aware of this until now. Mm -hmm says a lot. And so it's our challenge right now to look at all of the ways in which we're privileged and to untrain ourselves, to learn how to be aware that we're not seeing the whole world. And there's a very rich world of experience out there that we don't have privy to unless we go outside ourselves and educate ourselves, get to know other people. And I suppose in the other point that I want to make there is rather than looking at this as a burden and a responsibility and being scared of it, mm -hmm. there's tremendous opportunity because what we see is the world is so much more exciting and th thrilling than we ever knew possible. There's so much out there that we don't know that is just so exciting if we just open to other people's experience. So I'm hoping that we can try to reframe the challenges that many of us are experiencing right now that there's su with such a focus on racial injustice mm -hmm. to recognize the incredible opportunity we have to grow as a culture right now as we become more open to seeing other people's experience and making room for it. Yeah. I would love to get a sense of how does your book Radical Belonging 
fit into that piece of the puzzle, right? Because it's not going to be any one thing, right? That, but, but how, what are some ways in which you hope readers will take in your words and move forward, right? Um, because it, you know, when we talk about, well, if we just listen, right? We know that we've mentioned vulnerability already, right? It's, we know our fear is likely getting in the way. You know, the last thing we want is to be a bad person, but it, that's, we can't be afraid of making mistakes, right? Mistakes is what are what makes us human. Um, so yeah, I'm curious if you had any wishes or thoughts about how, how radical belonging might help people on their journey who have more privileged identity, let's say. Right. Well, rather than teaching people how to be better people, that's, that's not my goal in the book. Mm -hmm. My goal instead was to help people actually experience the beauty of radical belonging. Mm -hmm. I want us to kind of find our common humanity so that we can learn to love ourselves, even all of those aspects of ourselves that we were, were told are wrong or bad or that don't get validated in the culture, and learn how to celebrate ourselves and just see our humanity. And let, me, let me try to explain that in a different way. Sure. The, the book has a forward that was written by Ijoma Olua. And um, Ijoma is someone that I didn't know prior to writing this book and prior to asking her to write the forward. And she's someone I admire very much. And she has a very she has very different social identities than I do. One of them being that she's black. Um, I'm white. And she writes a lot about the black experience, centralizing that. And when one of the things that she wrote in her forward, and she was very taken by the book, was that Radical Belonging was a rare book where she saw herself in every chapter. And I was so touched by that because that's what I was trying to capture. What I wanted all of us to feel is that those experiences we have of unbelonging where we feel like there's something wrong with us, we don't fit in, or we feel shame for who we are, that's called being human. And the more we can accept that and kind of interrogate that, the more we recognize that that actually can be our source of connection with other people rather than keeping us apart. It's what we all share as humans. Mm -hmm. And so if we can share our vulnerability with other people, that's the opportunity for healing. So I wanted people to, to feel connected to others, to feel like that those experiences they have of unbelonging, that's because there's something wrong with a culture that doesn't value you. That's not because there's something wrong with you. Let's take a quick pause from this conversation for an important message from Bernie Salazar. Hey listeners, Bernie Salazar here asking you to support our show. Make your contribution at GoFundMe.com forward slash body kindness and 100% of any amount you can give goes to offset the production expenses. If 20 people can donate $25, it pays for this episode. Again, that's GoFundMe.com forward slash body kindness to chip in and support our show. We're so grateful to have you as a listener and we thank you for your support. I love that chapter. It's not you, it's the culture. And you you had two headings. Uh, the first place we're not allowed to belong is in our bodies. And the second place we're not allowed to belong is everywhere. And like, that was one of those belly laughs. I was like, spot on, you know, congratulations for that. And, and I think that it gets to the crux of exactly what we're talking about. The, there are even things that we think that feel like our, our own independent thoughts and feelings have actually been constructed for us and have created this divide, this feeling of you're not allowed to belong, 
you are other, you don't deserve to belong. And in, in that is a tremendous amount of pain. And it's very interesting to me that if, if almost anyone can feel like they don't belong somewhere, how do we get to a better place of healing? I think a lot of it is looking at, you know, I sometimes will talk about, it's like you turn that sword that's pointing inward, like oh, I'm terrible. And to be able to turn it outward, that, that, that it's not me, it is the culture, just like you say. So what are your, what are your thoughts around that? Okay. So, um, I think I got to bring up two pretty difficult words right now. All right. And those are shame and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So the first is that for all of those ways in which we don't belong, we're taught to feel shame. And the first thing I want people to understand is that that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. Shame, in fact, is something that's biologically wired into us as a way of protecting us. Mm -hmm. And let me like help to help people understand that concept that if you go back to prehistoric times, you had to function as a group. You know, nobody could survive alone. It was a dangerous world. And in order to be able to get food and protect yourself, you needed to bond with other people. Mm -hmm. And we were set up biologically with a felt sense that stops us whenever we do things that violate the community code. Mm -hmm. And that's a way of keeping us in belonging. And shame continues to this day to serve that. So, for example, if when I got um, shamed for my gender identity mm -hmm. as a kid, you know, like, my parents really wanted me to dress like a girl so that I would be liked by other people. And so I would fit in. Mm -hmm. And so I got shamed for wanting to wear my brother's hand-me-downs mm -hmm. all the time. And it was an act of love on my parents' part, because really what they were seeing was when I dressed that way, People did tease me and I, you know, it, it was a way of setting me aside as not fitting in as a real girl. And so the idea is protection, stay part of the group, be just like everybody else. And so everybody experiences shame on probably a daily basis right now mm -hmm. for the ways in which our culture tells us we're supposed to be something other. I know um, for the listeners of these podcasts, many of those people, many people experience shame around their body size, for mm -hmm. example. And even if they are slender enough to meet the cultural standards, there's this deep awareness that if they ever gain weight, they're going to be shamed. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of pressure to keep their thin privilege right? So oh, yeah. <laughs> whether you're fat or thin, shame plays a, a huge role mm -hmm. around this. Although I want to say that it's a very different experience. Like there's added layers if mm -hmm. you're fatter. So right. I don't want to say it's all the same experience, right? but shame around body size is huge for people of all genders and often magnified for people who are socialized as girls. But again, you know, it's something that's true for people of all genders and takes mm -hmm. very different forms. So we learn to protect ourselves. And in the ways in which we can hide the things we're shamed for, mm -hmm. we create an inauthentic self. So I learned to play girl and to try to fit in. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's also ways in which we can't hide ourselves, like our, the color of our skin, for example even though it sets us up to be treated as lesser than in the world, right? Mm -hmm. But so some of the things that we feel shame for, we can create an inauthentic self for and try to hide from others. And others, other things we're constantly exposed for and it affects our treatment of the world. So then we've got to figure out how do we manage all of this stuff? Mm -hmm. And so the next word that I want to bring in then is around vulnerability. 
Now, I don't want to suggest to everybody that we lose our protection in the world and we just be vulnerable and show our authentic selves to everybody, because in some circumstances, this could get you killed. Um, That's what's happening to Mm -hmm. black trans women of color these days. You know, Mm -hmm. already 30 have been murdered in the United States alone in 2020 at the time that we're recording this. So I'm not suggesting that you, everybody show themselves. There's reasons to develop in an authentic self and to protect yourself in the world and to try to hide some of the ways in which you're vulnerable to that sense of unbelonging, right? Yeah. But what I am suggesting is that we figure out how to make safe choices around this, that if you don't show your authentic self in the world, you're never going to feel belonging, but you've got to figure out a way in which you can do this that's safe for you. So you find friends and community that honor and validate and see you. And we have to create these worlds of refuge for one another where it's safe for people to show their authentic self. We have to learn to sit with people in all of their vulnerability with love and compassion and kindness. And we need to learn how to identify where those safe places are going to be for us. And we can all create, we can all work on changing the larger culture so that we allow more and more people in and to know that they belong. So this means that we're going to have to change our schools and our work sites to be more inclusive and to value the contributions of everybody across a range of identities. It means that we need greater representation in TV and in movies. Mm -hmm. You know, the work is endless in terms of how we can create a larger culture of belonging. And we all have opportunity on a smaller level in our little pockets and spheres of influence to open to other people, to see them and make room for them and create a world of safety and refuge for others around us. Mm-hmm. I want to I wanna take that a little further and ask if you had thoughts on on practical ways we could do that. You know, I'm thinking about the idea of connecting in an infinity group where where you share an identity with somebody else and in having that sense of safety within an affinity group. Yeah, that's excellent. And I think it's important, one, to recognize that that's just one tiny way and that we have endless tiny ways of being able to do that. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking too about, so like giving that example of your parent group mm-hmm. and in, in an affinity group with your parent group, you can number one, I'm sure bond together. Like mm-hmm. you have a shared experience mm-hmm. of the challenges and just being able to talk about it and know that you're not alone is valuable enough. And you may also be able to strategize and hear um, how other people are managing the difficulties. So it's also about like getting some concrete strategies that other people have tried and might have experience with. So that's really valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also important to keep interrogating who's not having that conversation with you and what are the challenges that make it difficult for other people. Right. And, Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm sure you're aware too, that a lot of parents, their challenge is not about how to manage the, their kids going to school remotely, Mm -hmm. but you know, they don't even have internet service or computers to be able to do that. And so you have a level of accessibility that other people don't. So there's all these levels that Mm -hmm. you could be working on change. I mean, changing the larger culture, working to help manage the challenges of the culture for you and your kids, 
So the possibilities are endless. Mm -hmm. And the other point that I want to make there is just how important it is that we don't get overwhelmed with all of this. Like there's always more you could be doing, (laughs) right? True. And And our inner manager just wants to do it all, make the checklist and cross it off. (laughs) And that will exhaust you. And so as much as you might want to change the world and recognize your privilege and work on that, also recognize that your individual experience is important too. And that you have to learn how to manage your world. Mm-hmm. It's not just about making it a better place for everybody else. And the more that you could manage your world and the more power you have to be able to go outside and um, challenge the bigger world as well. So I, I really want us all to take our personal experiences seriously. Mm -hmm. And we all have hard lives and we deserve to take care of ourselves. And not only that, it's a necessity. Mm -hmm. If we don't take care of ourselves and ground ourselves, we're going to be completely ineffective in being able to do something beyond ourselves. Mm -hmm. So my kids are in public school in DC and it was a Washington Post article about getting technology, having enough technology. And uh, there is an example of a parent with, um, who is in transition housing and has seven kids and was able to get them all devices, but who all were in different grade levels (laughs) and they had no headphones, you know? And so again, it's a small sliver, Right. How do I be in my difficulty? This is hard with my own compassion, right? That's part of my self-care, right? Securing my oxygen mask and those things, they are relevant. And hold space for the pain of others that is far worse and not to, and I think this is the the vital mistake we make, we we drive back into shame. Oh, well, aren't you an idiot for feeling like that that was hard? You know, you know, you go into like this comparison of who who has it worse as opposed to how can I use this information to, I guess for me, it's like to bring back in my acknowledgement right, of where my privileges lie and where my values are about a collective well-being and how might that guide a doable, meaningful action in this moment? And if not, how is it going to remind me and teach me so that I could be part of a better whole? Well said, and I'm not so sure I have any kind of (laughs) easy answer to that as much as this is something we all have to sit with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Well, I would love to ask you more questions about the book. Um, This pivots around shame and actually the stress chapter. Um, And I think you and I probably share some ideas for how um, body positivity is um, messing up, for lack of a better word, however you want to you know, talk about that, you know, the most privileged once again, but cishet, you know, mostly white women are taking important fat activism work and just kind of labeling it as a more comfortable body positivity. But back to our ideas of yes and to just act like there's not harm happening is really hurtful and oppressive. But in your writing, I'm not going to read everything of the excerpt, but what you're describing is, so you say this is somewhat at odds with our body positivity and self-help movements where there is a wealth of material available about practicing self-love and, hey, it's a panacea of life's ills. I would call that faux powerment because it doesn't offer any real power unless it changes the culture. But you go through this story where, you know, this person ends up in this place of astonishment, disappointment. It's like, I know better. You know, I've done the work. Where did I fall short? And you say they're afraid of being ashamed. They interpret the pain and grief triggered by a dehumanization of microaggression 
as evidence that they haven't been successful at practicing self-love. I mean, such a shame spiral to feel like I can't even do self-love right. Then you go on. If this ever happened to you, it's not because you failed to love yourself. No amount of self-love could have prevented the situation or prevented your own physiological response and emotional reaction. Your reaction resulted from two things, a culture that is hostile to your body and targets you for abuse, which of course is going to hurt, and your natural, normal, biological response to that painful stimuli. It's not you. It's the biology of oppression. You knocked it out of the park with that. (laughs) I mean, it's amazing writing. And I just would love for you to elaborate on that for listeners. Yeah, I'm again, I'm just glad that that's important to you. And um, it does feel to me like that's really drawing out one of the really important points of the book. And what I I mean, there's a lot I could respond to in that. But what I want to focus in on that we haven't talked about yet is that our biology sets us up to like, we have a biological response to protect ourselves. And so when there's a threat in the world, like when we've hit up against fat phobia, for example, it triggers a biologic stress response where We release cortisol, that's a stress hormone. Our senses, many of our senses become more acute. And so we're ready to kind of jump into action, whether it's to respond quickly to the situation, to run away, whatever it is. But there's biology that's at play. So even if in our minds we know that that was fat phobia, we didn't deserve that, our bodies are good that doesn't matter. There's this physiologic response that's going on in reaction to it that we don't have control over. And that sets us up for disease. It sets us up also in the moment for reactivity. So before our logical brain can come in and say, you know, don't tell off that person or don't, you know, run away right now. Like, we're flooded with the urge to do something. And how biology is going to affect us is going to be very individual. For some people, it might trigger a shutdown and depression. Mm -hmm. For other people, it might trigger anger and, you know, maybe a violent reaction. For other people, the first thing they're going to think of is, I can't stand this place. Get me a drink. Mm -hmm right? We all have these biological systems and different ways of reacting to stress Mm -hmm. that are ingrained in us. And this is the challenge of our humanity is that the logical experience of how we're supposed to react to things isn't the only thing that's going on. There's this felt sense that courses through our body that causes us to react in certain ways. And so part of this is that we all need to learn skills to better be able to manage discomfort. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we get better and better at. Um, Some of us learn skills from a young age and do it much better than others. If we had, if we grew up in a loving family where we were valued and accepted, um, it we're biologically wired to kind of sit with things to know that, oh, I can share that with a friend and they'll understand and I'll feel better. And so the biologic wiring is more is to go to find ways to comfort ourselves that are fairly healthy and nourishing, nurturing, even though we're feeling uncomfortable. But others didn't learn those skills. And so we're biologically wired to not be able to tolerate the discomfort as easily and to rush into these reactive experiences. But the fortunate thing is that regardless of how we've been trained, 
at any point in our life, we can learn those skills to be able to better sit with discomfort and take ourselves through those difficult times. And I know that those are the kinds of skills that you're that you teach people. And there are a lot of different skills you can learn. One of them is practicing using our friends and finding friendship. You know, the more you talk about these experiences, the more you realize, the less, the more you realize that you're not alone and it helps you to sit with the discomfort. You can also learn skills like, for example, a meditation practice can help train your mind to be able to sit with the present moment better without going into that reactive space. Mm -hmm. And meditation is not for everybody, but for many people, it can be a way of retraining your brain. And I would encourage, because I definitely have that, oh, it's mindfulness isn't for me and whatnot. Um, Even that curiosity to explore. Uh, you know, I remember just going to this hour long sound bath, right? And all I had to do was show up and lay down, but went with a friend, right? And it was, it was the whole thing, right? The meal before the sound bath, the, the, the sound bath experience. And then we did some journaling and writing after, right? Like there's, you know, lots of, I think opportunities, what, you know, how you might be able to be open to be like, want to try this out. Maybe try it a few times and see. Um, Because sometimes there's a part of us that's stepping in with that, you know, we might call it resistance, but it's actually burdened by some amount of caution. Like can't get too vulnerable. We don't want to open up this <laughs> this box like a jack in the box. We don't know what's going to jump out at us. But the like you're saying, the more you can lean into discomfort, maybe with a sense of compassion and curiosity and openness, you know, and I love how you talked about um, connecting with a friend. And, you know, maybe it's an area where you ask your friend about what they do to cope. And maybe they might help guide some mindfulness or meditation or other types of um, compassion, you know, exploring. You know, and it's interesting to even, you know, when we look at it as self care, because I do think bringing it back into the collective that we wouldn't be so focused on needing to talk about self-care, bubble bath, self-care, lavender oil, right? Like things that I write about and talk about all the time, right? If we actually were in a culture where, you know, we dominantly offered and received care, right? That it was a collective caregiving already happening. So in some ways, again, like you said, it is vital, 100% aligned. It is vital. And, And also, how do we say yes and to that? You know, with where are the injustices in the culture where we're not set up to have people collectively offer and receive caregiving and almost sort of maybe a flow state or that sense of community. And to your point earlier about how can you um, notice that benefit of whatever it is you're giving to yourself. You know, I took my time brushing my teeth tonight and used floss, <laughs> the littlest thing that you're noticed to have gratitude for, and to hold space for that, that a gratitude toward the privileges that allow you to even be in that space to benefit from those things and notice and name those things. And um, at least you're engaged in a practice of connection um, that I think is also really important. I know we need to go soon, but I am going to request one more question if we can. It has to do with a part of the book that I was so personally grateful for, where you talk about the counterintuitive wisdom of disorders and diseases. And you kind of go deeper into diabetes and you know, I would say something, diabetes runs in my family. Um, My mom has diabetes. My sister has diabetes. Of course, if I'm engaging in, you know, the broader helping professional space, not in my little health at every size folks who get it bubble, right? But there's a lot of, but what ifs about around diabetes and then correlating weight and diabetes. And there's a lot of misinformation, but you offer some really helpful deconstruction in this section. So I wanted to make sure I bring it up so listeners know um, that they're really going to be deeply helped 
by those things that seem so separate, like our physical health and mental health. And you do a great job at at integrating them. But I would just love to know what why you decided to write about this and what do you hope readers get out of this part? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, I, um, I think that it's so important that we recognize that a lot of the things that happen in our bodies, whether it's our psychological states and or our physiologic states, not that there's always such a difference between them. Like, for example, anxiety and depression have there's physical physicality to them, too. So I, I don't really necessarily like having these separate categories. But nonetheless, what I want to do is just recognize that all of them are adaptive responses that in some ways are our bodies trying to find health in a world that's not so healthy. And so, and diabetes is an example of something that I think we've gotten completely wrong in terms of how we tend to envision it. And Particular, uh, I want to focus specifically in on type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's a disease where there's a lot of stigma, and the whole idea that gets promoted all the time is that it's all about weight. It's because people don't eat right, they don't exercise. This results in high weight, and then they get diabetes, and they brought it about themselves. And the fact that Type 2 diabetes is much more common among larger people. I think probably over 90% of the people that are diagnosed with type, type 2 diabetes. I'm not sure if that's true anymore. That I'm, I, It's been a while since I've been studying that, but there was a point where that was true. But over 90% of people had that had type 2 diabetes were in the category called obese. Mm -hmm. And I say category called obese just because I don't like that term. Um, I'm just You're using, using what was that, given to us. <laughs> right. Like it's a term that science uses to assign pathology to people. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so when you see that this is happening larger, to, mostly to larger people, it's too easy to just keep buying into all of those ideas. And, you know, the next step in it is to suggest well, we just tell people to eat less and exercise more and to lose weight and then problem solved. And what we find is that, first off, the idea of weight being a causative thing isn't backed up by the evidence, nor is the idea to diet or to lose weight a solution that has proved to actually be valuable. And it I don't think I could do a very quick deconstruction here, but I can basically just say that while it's true that larger people are more vulnerable to getting di to diabetes, it's not necessarily because of their weight. Now, I'm not going to say that weight doesn't play any role, but what I am going to say is that its role is very much exaggerated and that it's a lot easier when you look at the data to view type 2 diabetes as a disease of oppression, of people having hard lives and stress and um, that contributing. And also there's a genetic component mm -hmm. as well. And I should say this too, I, like I want to bring up that I'm relatively thin and I eat well and I exercise regularly. I do everything that's right. And I have a lot of those diseases that we tend to blame on obesity. Like I have low level hypertension. Mm -hmm. I have joint problems and back problems. I have hiatal hernia. There's, there's a lot of things that we tend to blame on weight that we see in slender people. And all of my diagnoses were missed at first because people don't expect to see them in someone like me. Mm -hmm. So. This healthcare idea of um, kind of tracking everything with weight hurts everybody. It, you know, in terms of getting good medical care and really treating what the problems are. But anyway, so if we study diabetes, we can see that there are a lot of other things that are playing a role. 
and that when people are treated better in the world, when they have more opportunity um, and are supported, that there's a lot of evidence that shows that type 2 diabetes incidence goes down and is reversed. Like there's a research study, for example, that showed that just giving people who um, were experiencing poverty and had type 2 diabetes housing vouchers so that they can live in a nice place without the stress of being able to afford it, inc- uh, improve their diabetes dramatically. They weren't even told anything about changing their dietary habits or their um, exercise, but that alone was enough. Yeah. So what we have to do is we have to re-examine all of those ideas that we have about diabetes and recognize that we weren't asking the right questions when we examined the relationship, when we, when we started to see that heavier people are more likely to get type 2 diabetes, to figure out what the real cause is. Yeah. And likewise, even if people go on diets and they start to lose weight and we start to see their diabetes um, improve, it doesn't mean that that is the result of the diet temporarily um, putting less calories in your body means that your blood sugar levels are lower. And so it's going to seem as if your diabetes is getting better, right? But that doesn't mean that you're addressing the long-term problem. And again and again, what we see is that you can't track improvements in diabetes to weight changes, but what you but it is a lot easier to track other like like improvements around stress management and being treated better in the world so what i always want to suggest is that if we really want to help with diabetes the first thing we need to do is things like increase minimum wage mm. that that alone is going to on a population level really have dramatic changes. Now, on an individual level, of course, there's things people can do. I mean, one is that we can learn that the world doesn't treat us so well, and we can learn to develop our skills for managing that better. And yes, changing diet and exercise will play a role, but I also want to suggest that its role is really blown out of proportion. Right. But weight loss, on the other hand, that we don't see any value or benefit to that. And in fact, we see the reverse, that when people intentionally try to do weight, it ends up doing a lot of harmful damage. Mm -hmm. So I'm always in support of people finding ways to to take better care of themselves, whether that's about a more nourishing pattern with food and moving more in the world, moving in our bodies, things like that, but not not with the Um, with the goal of helping us to feel better and appreciate ourselves more as opposed to because we necessarily think it's going to help us to lose weight or even help us to be healthier. I think it's that because, hey, you know, particularly if you have a stressful life, Eating more vegetables is not really going to have a dramatic improvement on um, disease markers. Yeah. Right? (laughs) That there's a lot more important things that you can be paying attention to. On the other hand, um, if you have the conditions in your life that are better, we do see that changing eating behaviors does have a more marked um, effect Mm -hmm. on your health. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that just prescribing eating better tends to almost widen, or not almost, it does, it widens the health divide because it helps people in more privileged circumstances more than it helps people who are more disadvantaged. Right. It widens widens the divide unless we're going to talk about, we we can't talk about food without talking about food access. And I also, as much as I want, like, I think it's so important that we keep looking at these systemic issues. Mm -hmm. I think it's also really important to recognize that we as individuals suffer Mm -hmm. from these systemic issues. Mm -hmm. And so, as, so while 
we want a culture that supports us better, that supports us in the profession so that as dietitians, you, you all know, you know, how, how best to help people with access, et cetera. Um, there's also, it's also really important as individuals that we figure out, so what are the tools that I need to celebrate and take good care of my body, given my particular circumstances and what I have access to. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to discount the value of people learning, for example, to have more fiber in their diet, Mm -hmm. because that's, you know, one of the many tools that you have that's going to help with diabetes. Mm -hmm. But all this stuff has to take place in context for, for us to figure out how to support people in Mm self-care. It's not a matter of prescribing more fiber to someone. It's a matter of looking at their whole life experience and what is going to be most valuable for them to be able to love and nourish their body. Yeah. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash bodykindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search Body Kindness and request to join the group for Body Kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.